Welcome back. Hashtag Elin here along with Mrs. Snarky. Hi, I'm kind of a human being today. <laughs> I don't think I am completely either, so... Wait, I'm maybe a... together we make a complete human. Yes. <laughs> yes. See, like, it's, it's this whole existential crisis thing. <laughs> I have an upcoming birthday, oh. and I'm... And I'm... Yeah, it's starting to, like, settle. Mm. And I'm going, yeah. And plus all the work that we've been doing with this book has already, like, had me in a whole different headspace than I'm used to. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Maddie. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, it's it's been fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's work that needs to be done. It's important. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's definitely worth it. Introducing me and Casey. Yeah, and, do you want to show yourself? And this book, um, a, a classic shilling. <laughs> I heard it right here. <clears throat> Insert shell here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, classic shilling. <laughs> Subscribe to the Classic Shilling. Yeah, today we're doing the rest of um, chapter one. No. <laughs> chapter <laughs> ten. ten. Chapter one zero. <laughs> yeah, one zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I swear to God I'm awake. I'm just not coherent. Um, but yeah, the rest of chapter ten, which is first steps. It's the first part of the recovery section um, or part three of the book. Or the hard yeah. part. Yeah, the hard part. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely is. Yep, and uh, I believe, are we at, yeah, teach yourself to grieve. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we're at now. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. Which starts off with this quote that's really profound and important. Um, deal with your feelings before they deal with you. Which is a quote from the rehab counselor in the movie Postcards from the Edge. Another, a movie I haven't seen. I haven't but, seen that one either. No. Um, but yeah, your feelings will definitely deal with you if you don't deal with them. Mm -hmm. So that's very... Aww. <laughs> <laughs> She's lounging in the sun. That got me in the feels. <laughs> but... But yeah, if you repress emotions, they're going to come bubbling up to the surface no matter what. Mm -hmm. and if you just let them, you know, sit below the surface, they're going to come up in ways that are really, usually really bad and out mm -hmm. of your control. So it's best to go ahead and deal with it. That way you have some sort of responsibility and some way of coping with those feelings as opposed to just mm -hmm. yeah. aim the beast <laughs> yes um, but yeah um she says the grief process begins with another decision to let your feelings be there i had to teach myself how to do this particularly when my feelings were sad or angry you know the bad ones right uh, as I learned to feel, there were some days when I would stay home from work, send the children to school, close the blinds, get the pillows, and just let myself cry, scream, hit pillows, or whatever I needed to do to let out steam. At first, I just sat there and no feelings would surface, but I knew that there were mounds of feelings because they would come out in other ways when I least expected them. There's that whole uh, out of control thing I was talking about. Mm. Eventually, giving myself this time, my tears would begin to leak and then pour. The trick was to let them be, to feel them. This is difficult when you've been taught, taught to stuff it or suck it up or not to feel anything, to be phony, to pretend everything is all right when it isn't. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And we were really taught that, like, you know, don't, don't show um, the negative feelings, especially the negative feelings, uh, in public or, or even around, um, my mom, 
because mm -hmm. then it would be the whole, you know, you're being dramatic, you're trying to manipulate me with your tears, crybaby, you know, shit like that. Yeah. You're um, making me feel bad with yeah. your feces. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's, I, I do this to this day, the whole stuffing down of emotions and trying to deny them, but, um, I am getting better with just letting myself feel feelings in the moment. Yeah, I'm, I don't know if I'm getting better or not. Um, <laughs> I've seen some improvement. So maybe that's a yes, but sometimes it's still like when it's something that really just gets me to the core, then it, it can still get beyond my control and I can still just, I have that urge to just stuff it. But every once in a while <laughs> I let it go and sometimes it's just not good timing. Yeah, you're right. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh yeah and I know where all these feelings are coming from you know when I'm in the situation but it's so hard for me to sort through it in that split second mm -hmm. that, sure. that I'm feeling it and then I just burst out and it's like eh, it's not fun um, but it's a process mm -hmm. you know I had this happen to me yesterday, and it was not fun. Oh. But, you know, uh, it was a situation of misunderstanding, and I just, like, burst into tears, and it just ruined everything, um, which now I feel guilty about. Oh, yeah. another no. yeah. aspect of it. But, you know, I had to explain, look, Maddie, I'm sorry. It's just, you know, the, the circumstances reminded me of this or that. And I'm going through this with this book. And it's kind of making some things come to the surface that I didn't really deal with yet. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mainly when it comes to taking care of myself and... Um, have, feeling like I need to push, 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 push in order mm -hmm. to take care of things, even to the detriment of my own health and things like that. Because, you know, my pain never mattered. It was always mom or dad, and, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, you'll be fine. I'm older and I'm, you know, this or that. So do for me. Anyway, it, it was just a whole thing. And yeah. Dealing it with it, dealing with it. You might want to cut all that. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> like, we're we're here to talk about what we're going through. and Yeah, yeah. It's... I guess it does help because, you know, we're not alone in this. And there are people that are going through a lot of the same stuff. Especially if they're going through this process of actually assessing their feelings and... There's going to be times when it's not, you know, great. Mm -hmm. And this is, as she said before, this is the hard part. And you can't skip it. Even though you might feel urged to, you can't. You've, you've got to go through it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Sit with those feelings. Sit with the pain. Manage the anxiety and depression that come with it so you can work through it. Don't try to talk yourself out of it. Others around you may try to do this. No one wants to see you hurt. Your loved ones may not understand how important this is. So don't listen to them. Let yourself feel. When the old denial uh, tries to reassert itself or the critical internal messages begin again, chase them away. Tell yourself you deserve this time to heal. That's important. Yeah. Yep, and you do deserve it. Like, you didn't... You didn't have the ability to go through this while it was happening. Uh, I mean, you did go through it, obviously, but you didn't really, like, let yourself feel those. So, you know, mm -hmm. now is the time to sit with that and process the feelings, like they said previously, actually process them, as opposed to just telling a story about them. Yeah, and not only were we in an environment, were we in an environment where we were uh, 
expected to repress those feelings. We also were young. We didn't have the maturity that is necessary, nor the guidance that's necessary to um, to process these things in a way that was actually um, beneficial to our learning, our, immer uh, our emotional education, uh -huh. which, well, you know, is extremely lacking when you're raised by narcissists. Uh -huh. Extremely lacking. So, you know. Yeah, usually they don't have the capacity to deal with their own emotions, let alone how to teach their children to deal with emotions. Definitely not. And as we stated before, you know, children learn through mirroring. And if your parent, you know, that you're mirroring has no capacity to deal with emotional turmoil or any emotions, really, other than, you know, I'm happy with you, you know, my adoring mother, then, <laughs> then, you know, you have absolutely no basis, uh, at least not no healthy basis to um, maneuver or through these, uh -huh. through these things. So, yeah, I'm totally articulate. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, she, uh, she goes on to say, it is common for you to feel like a wimp or to call yourself a baby. I do this on a regular basis, even now when I have feelings to process. I have to tell myself, it's okay to be a baby right now. Babies are sweet and innocent. You won't be a baby forever. I promise it doesn't last because you work through that in this very way. And yeah, I have real problems with when I start crying because she would say, you know, you're trying to manipulate me or you cry baby, um, stuff like that. So that voice is like always there like, oh, really? Really? You let this make you cry? <laughs> My sensor. But yeah, so like because she would be quick to label me as a baby in those situations, um, I just, like, emotional situations, I can't, I just don't have the capacity really to deal with and, um, process it. Like, give me physical pain and I can get through that, but, like, emotional pain or emotional situations and I just, like, I break very easily. Yeah, yeah. I'm a baby when it comes to all of it. I'm a baby when I'm sick. I'm a baby when I'm in pain. I'm a baby when I'm <laughs> emotional. I'm just, a, I'm just, yeah, I'm a baby. It's cool. It's cool. <laughs> I'm sweet and innocent. Right? <laughs> yeah. And I thought that was a really cool way to frame that. Like, it is. You, you need to be in a, a vulnerable position to deal with these things. And, like, now you can. Of course, when you were an actual baby, you couldn't, or when you were a child. But, um, now like sit in that moment and process it and try to work through it mm -hmm. and it sucks but it does <laughs> it, it's worth it but it's also kind of cathartic because you can yeah you can kind of like when you hear that voice of your mom calling you a baby you can just be like well mom you're a fucking toddler mm -hmm. so who's stealing from the baby, so how do you feel? Mm -hmm. Um, anyways, that's, yep. But, um, yeah, she goes on to say, you may begin to try to rationalize away the pain. I shouldn't feel this way, or I didn't have it that bad. This won't help. Whatever is there, you need to release. Let it be. Sometimes, in order to do this, you have to be quiet and take time to be alone. If you are used to keeping busy to avoid the pain or to using a substance or some addiction to numb the pain, you will notice the feelings coming up when you slow down and sit quietly or allow yourself to be alone. This is very important to do. Set aside some time alone solely for this grieving process. Do it several times until you begin to feel relief. And yeah, the whole, I didn't have it that bad. I mean, I, I heard that from people outside the family and, you know, I saw examples where children were locked in cages and denied food and clothing and, like, a bathroom. And I'm like, well, it's not that bad, so it shouldn't matter. Mm. Um, but again, like, 
trauma is trauma is trauma and you need to deal with the trauma that you went through whether or not it was as bad as somebody else's yeah so. all the all the what about isms like that serve mm -hmm. to do is distract away from what you need to deal with mm -hmm. Yeah, so. and it's another way to shut down the processing of those emotions, mm -hmm. because if you think, you know, uh, well, I'm not entitled to feel that way, well, you're not going to deal with the emotions then. You're not going to go through it. You're not going to process it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, my gosh. But, yeah, it is important to sit down and actually feel it. And it's it's weird because, you know, I always thought, well, I have been doing that. I've been sitting there and I've been in grief for years, but it's been different though. This is actually facing it, not mm -hmm. just kind of, kind of what I did was angry grief, like wallowing in self-pity, not really mm -hmm. looking at, you know, my own behaviors and things that I have to process my, you know, yeah. as well. Um, so that wasn't really helpful either. Um, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> and, uh, lastly here, she says, try several different things until you find what works for you. I do best when I'm home alone with the shades drawn. Some women like to take long walks, go for long runs, hike in the mountains, go for long drives or sit in coffee shops. Everyone is different, and it is important for you to find your comfort zone. The most important thing is that you allow it to happen. Having been taught not to do this, daughters of narcissistic mothers at first feel awkward giving themselves this emotional attention, but you can do it. Yep. And um, my go-to is usually the shower. Mm. Um, it's, <laughs> it's kind of like... I don't know, I'm alone, it's warm, I can just close my eyes and feel like I'm in a cocoon, you mm -hmm. know, and I can just let go and be totally vulnerable, which you are, you know, in the shower. Mm -hmm. So, but the door is locked, so it's fine. Mm -hmm. You're safe, you know, it's kind of like being in the womb again, I guess. <laughs> I don't know, but that's what I've gone to. Either that or, you know, bath or something. But, yeah. And listening to sad music while I... Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Put it on the sad music station on Pandora, right? Mm hmm <laughs> The emo stuff. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, this is really important that everyone knows knows the stages of grief because part of being a human being is you're going to have grief in your life that's just how it is rich poor whatever you're going to have instances in your life that put you in grief you're going to have loss you're going to have pain you're going to have trauma in some way shape or form there's no escaping it it is the human condition so I think it's important for people to know and recognize the stages of grief. Um, so she's going to look at the examples of how it works. Um, uh, I guess first I could read this excerpt here. The natural grief process is written by Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross on in on death and dying consists of five stages, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. For your recovery, we'll be using these stages too, but we put acceptance first. We will already have been engaged in denial and bargaining with mother for a long time, and without acceptance, we cannot move on to deal with our, our true feelings. Seriously, motorcycle dude? Okay, yes, you have a big penis, I get it. Um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, without acceptance, we stay in denial. After acceptance, we can process the anger and depression of our loss so that we can free ourselves from the pain we have felt over a lifetime. So let's look at some of the examples of how this works for us. 
and see when I was talking about you know how I grieved before and my self pity and all that the reason why it didn't work is I didn't come to acceptance first and that was key mm -hmm. so I think it's I think it was important to kind of mention oh our stages of grief fun stuff number one acceptance we have to accept first that mother has limited love and empathy to give or we cannot allow ourselves out of the denial to learn how to feel our feelings acceptance is the first step in recovery after we've realized our problem so yeah it's it's kind of like you're gonna go back and forth between bar denial bargaining anger and depression you know all the other stuff until you get to the root cause which is the dynamics that you had growing up and the lack of guidance and nurturing and support that you uh should have received mm -hmm. should uh yeah <laughs> from mom and you didn't get that so you have to come to acceptance of that first which is tough. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's really tough. And even, you know, this might take years. Mm -hmm. It might take a long time of examination. And we might come full circle and come back to accepting another aspect of that, that dynamic that we hadn't yet discovered was affecting our lives. So... I think that's also important to mention. Uh, okay, so the next stage, uh, which we should be very familiar with, is denial. Uh, as children, we had to deny that our mothers were incapable of love and empathy, so we could survive. A child yearns for love above all else, and we needed the denial to keep growing and surviving. Sad but true. Uh -huh. Very sad but true. Um... So number three, bargaining. We have been bargaining our whole life with mother, both internally and with her. We have been wishing and hoping and thinking and praying. Oh, wishing uh, and <laughs> hoping and dreaming. <laughs> that she will change. That she will be different next time we need her. We have tried many things over the years to win her love and approval. To no avail. Oh, uh, yeah, no. Not at all. And majority of, like, I think those two, denial and bargaining, were just pervasive the entire time dealing with her. You yeah. know, you're like, oh, well, you have, oh, it's not that bad. She's not abusive. And, oh, please don't be like this next time. Next time it'll be perfect. Next time she won't do this. Next time. Next time. And it doesn't work that way. Um, yeah. and yeah, so these two, I think, were, were the most, um, present, I guess, yeah, throughout that. Yeah, you, you bounce back and forth between these two a lot. Now, for me, my main stage was number four, anger. We feel intense anger and sometimes rage when we realize our emotional needs were not met and this neglect has affected our lives in severe adverse ways. We feel angry at mother and ourselves for allowing pa this pattern, our patterns to develop and for being stuck. Yep. And I, I realized from a very young age that there was some wrong with mama. Mm. And though I was, I would go through this, these times of denial and bargaining and all that, it always come back around to anger and then guilt because I got angry. Uh -huh. And then back to the whole process. And it, God, I was angry. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> I your reason to be, but uh -huh. go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, when I realized that it was abuse and that it wasn't normal, um, yeah, that was, that was where I was for a very long time, was just like, well, fuck that, like, why the fuck yeah. have I had to deal with this? Why me? Um, 
why her um why any of this and like that is a question we'll never get an answer to but yeah was i mad oh and yeah. even to this day i'll still have moments where you know like if i if i have like a knee-jerk reaction that i can tie back to being programmed this way i then you know like you said i feel guilty and then uh, i'll have that anger stage where it's just like I just want this to be gone. I don't want to mm -hmm. deal with this. I don't want to have to go through this every time. Yeah. Yeah. There are times when I feel like, and honestly, I feel it's justified for me to say this ruined my life. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. It ruined my fucking life. Like, you know, all the, and well, get into that later on as to why it ruined my life but holy shit like how are you going to put your love of some dude that doesn't love you over your kid how the fuck are you gonna do that mm -hmm. and that's kind of the anger, the source of the anger that I felt since I was 12, 13, 14. I was really stewing in it then. Because I was like coming to this realization that this is what was going on. And then from that point, like 14, I knew for sure. This bitch don't love me more than herself. Definitely not. Definitely not enough to put her child over these random dudes she was meeting at the bar. Uh, so that, like, it still pisses me off. Ugh. Mm -hmm. You're not a, you're not a mom. You're just, you're an egg fucking donor. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, depression, which comes with the territory of feeling like your mom doesn't give a fuck, uh, because she's demonstrated it time and time and time and time again. We feel intense sadness that we have to let go of the hope for and the vision of the kind of mother we wanted. We realize that she will never be as loving as we want her to be. We feel like orphans or unmothered children. We let go of all expectations. We grieve the loss of the vision of these expectations. Uh -huh. And this comes with the territory of acceptance too mm, yeah because you do have to you do have to grieve that you do have to realize the truth the hey mom wasn't capable mm -hmm. and yeah it did run our lives but we can pick up the pieces and we can carry on. We can cope with this. So she goes on to say, during the grief process, you will bounce around through all these stages back and forth. Don't move on until you solidly accept that your mother was indeed narcissistic and did not give you the love you needed and wanted. For only then you can properly grieve. If you find yourself not accepting, go back and work on it again. It is the prerequisite for the work to come. And that's kind of, it kind of gives me pause because, you know, I, I'm sure y'all can tell from, especially when I was reading the anger stage that I still got some real big resentment. Um, and I have not, there's a lot I have not let go of because it was just so fucked up. Mm -hmm. And we had such fucked up lives that could have been avoided. But, you know, her needs were more important than, you know, my life. Yeah. Uh, it's just, Jesus, fuck. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's still, I still have a lot of work to do. So. Well, and I think it's important to note that acceptance is not necessarily forgiveness or an excuse. Um, it's more of saying, okay, well, this is how she is. And 
um, it's never going to be different. And, you know, but you're not saying it's okay. You're not saying, um, yeah, don't worry about it or, you know, no, no big deal. Um, it's just, it's simply noting who and what your mother is. Yeah, well, I mean, that part I've gotten to, mm -hmm. but it bucks me that I'm still angry about it. I'm damn near 40 years old, and I still just become totally enraged when I think about all the times that that bitch went back to that stupid fucking control freak abusive father of mine over and over again, even when I was a baby. Knowing mm -hmm. what he was, allowing him to take my life away from me. Mm -hmm. I... And I think that's normal. Like, I don't, I don't think that acceptance means that you're never going to feel those feelings ever again. Um, it's more you understand that this isn't going to change. But, yeah, I mean, they're, yeah. they're definitely... I mean... Well, I mean, for us, <laughs> yeah. nothing's like I, really changing. <laughs> I definitely know that that's not changing, mm -hmm. but I just, I want to be free of it. I don't think I'll ever be completely free of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yay! <sighs> anyway, so... One thing that does help, and I've talked about this before, is uh, using a journal for the recovery process. It does help. It it helps on the level that you know that you can just write anything down. You don't have to worry about, you know, having to tell another person or disconnect even uh from your feelings as much when you write it down and it's for you mm -hmm. and you can go back and read it and you can analyze it but you can also feel what's on the page mm -hmm. and you can stain it with some tears because that makes it really mm -hmm. legit mm -hmm. if you got a journal that ain't stained with tears then i don't know what the hell you're doing with your journal <laughs> Well, mine's on the computer, so it's, it's a well, little don't, hard. Yeah, don't stain that one. <laughs> uh, but me, but I, yeah, I, I cry quite a bit through it. This is my journal. And uh, it's stained with tears. I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. Um. Let's see. Yeah, she talks about she has a, a grief file on the computer, so that works just as well. Just have you some tissues. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, she says um, a lot of people struggle with this, but nonetheless, I encourage you to use a journal because it means you're taking your recovery seriously, which is important. If you're committing to writing down, keeping track of it, and monitoring your progress, as she says in the book, then you're definitely showing commitment. Your health and happiness are worth this investment of time. You want to take control of your own healing and deal consciously with these lifelong feelings or they will control you and you do not want them to control you. Mm -hmm. um, so this um, exercise was, oh my God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, wow, is, you don't think it's going to be hard, like, when you think about the concept of, okay, um, define what you needed from your mom, but it really, it really is, and, um, this part, grieving the mother you never had, every little girl deserves to have a mother who is crazy about her. If you don't have a loving mother, you have a right to grieve the loss. And as you let feelings come up, recognize them and write them down. Start with a list of what the ideal mother would look like to you. Think about either what you wanted 
or what you saw in other mothers that you knew. Contrast what you wanted to what you had with your own mother. Face the disappointments and the pain you felt. This is extremely important at this phase of recovery. Find the holes, write them down, and it is okay to do this. So yeah, um, did that. I did it. I did it too. <laughs> um, <It's>... Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know, did you want to go through some of the things on there? Or... Well, what I ended up doing was just writing a paragraph. Mm-hmm. Uh, which does list the things. Um, my ideal mom. I want a mom that will actually listen to me when I express how I feel and will be there when I need her. Not just when she needs me. One who is honest instead of manipulative and is able to not only see my worth as a person, but encourage my talents, ideas, and endeavors and not set me aside just to fulfill her own needs. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, that's very similar. Um, I kind of broke it down in like a bulleted list, but um, compassionate, uh, who would let me talk about hardships and vent instead of critiquing my every traitor action would be there for me, reassure me, and help me move on in a healthy way. Empathetic, would understand my point of view and how things can hurt me. She would feel my pain and again, be there for me to help me deal with life. Emotionally mature, would be able to feel all emotions and process them in a healthy way. I never had a model for how to deal with things emotionally and to this day I have problems because of it. I wish I had learned healthy coping mechanisms from an early age so it's not like trying to rewire a whole house. Understanding of a disability. She would understand I'm disabled and not expect me to take care of her on top of trying to take care of myself. She wouldn't scold me on days that I desire to sleep in. She wouldn't scold me for days where I couldn't make it to her house. She wouldn't lessen my situation by explaining that I should do for her because my pain isn't as bad as hers physically being there. Um, I wish she would have gone to all of my high school events and really supported me through my endeavors. I wish she wouldn't have talked me out of continuing to going, going to my dream college. I wish she wouldn't have gone to the effort to remain in Minnesota for me the whole hospitalization, which was a month and a half, because she could blog about how much she is sacrificing for me. I wish she would have done that out of wanting to be there for me instead. I wish she wouldn't have stayed. I wish that when I got news that my condition would turn into pancreatic cancer, that she would have understood my want to be home with Greg instead of asking me if we should start the journey home and then yelling at me the whole way home. We should have stayed in a hotel. We shouldn't be driving home. Why did you need to go home? I wanted to be with him because he showed the compassion that she did not. I had gotten basically a death sentence and she was concerned about not wanting to drive even though I offered and she wouldn't let me. And finally, I wish she appreciated me for who I am and raised me not to base my entire worth on accomplishments. I fight the feeling daily that I'm worthless because of my disability, and I wish she would have not valued us for what we could do for her or how we looked on paper to outsiders. Wow. That's... It's a long list. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, you deserve better than that. And you did too. I think we all did, but... Yep. We did. Um... Woo! So um, there's some other, other examples that she put in here. Um... Uh, she also says, even though most daughters feel sad that they did not receive the proper love from their mothers, they have a deep list, a belief system ingrained from childhood that they do not or did not deserve a loving mother. But you deserve it! And if you didn't have this love, you must acknowledge that you did not get it. And that, and that as a result, 
you have this hole, a void in your emotional development. Facing the sadness is crucial to developing your sense of self today. I'm not saying that you become permanently sad about this, but you recognize it, face it, and allow yourself to feel sad about the pain this has caused you. We will move beyond this stage of grief. Um, this is not where you will live the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I think is important is this next paragraph. Because uh, you hear all this different people, well-meaning people, maybe, that give you advice either because they genuinely care for you or they, and they don't like to see you in pain or they just like can't be bothered, I guess. Um, but it differs from person to person. Um, but yeah, she says, don't listen to others as you go through this process. Well-meaning friends and loved ones often say things like, forget it already. You can't undo the past, quit trying, quit thinking about the past and be in the present. These closest to you and some not so close will discourage you from doing this important work because they do not understand how important it is. They may not want to, to see you suffer, so they try to fix it. They don't understand that if you don't face this sadness, it will remain part of you forever. Do not listen to this unqualified advice. This is precisely why so many people today are projecting their feelings, misbehaving, creating crisis for themselves and others, suffering from depression and anxiety, and are not being accountable for their own actions and emotions. They're not facing the truth about their own pain. I am giving you, from personal and professional experience, the key to working through the third step of recovery so that it is effective. If you ignore this step out of fear or because you listen to others' opinions, recovery will not work. This step is the most important step of recovery. So I do want to mention that, you know, I've, I've spoken about mindfulness and being in the present and things like that during times of anxiety not during times when you're actually processing your emotions, which is important. Mm -hmm. um, and as she said before, this isn't something that you're just going to live in, right? You're going right. to have moments where you, you're not going to be crying and all, you know, <laughs> messed up over this. There's a time to grieve and a time to be present and a time to relax and enjoy your life. Remember, it's important to enjoy your life but you're not going to be able to if you don't also process your grief, mm -hmm. feel it. So I did want to mention that as well. <sighs> yeah, this was, this was really touching. Um, sometimes children understand the need to grieve and cry better than adults do. As I was writing this chapter, a friend emailed me a story about a four-year-old who understood something that many adults have forgotten. This child's next-door neighbor was an elderly gentleman who had recently lost his wife. Upon seeing the man cry, the little boy went into the old gentleman's yard, climbed on his lap, and just sat there. When his mother asked what he had said to the neighbor, the little boy said nothing. I just helped him cry. Your grieving uh, may take the form... Oh, sorry. <laughs> No, I was just going to say that is so touching and it adorable is. and perfect. It is, it. and it's so true. Yeah. But. Go yeah, ahead. <laughs> your, your grieving may take the form of intense sadness, anger, and even rage. Don't act on these feelings other than to write them down. Don't be destructive to yourself or others, but let yourself feel these emotions. Grieve until you can't stand yourself anymore. I know I'm done with grieving something when I'm sick of myself. Eventually you will go from feeling like you are carrying huge luggage with you every day of your life to being a light traveler who has discarded her baggage and is now feeling only intense relief. Oh, I want some intense relief. Right? I feel lighter. I mean, like I said, this is my third time going through this, but like it's still, I still feel like there's shit there. <laughs> Yeah. Me too. Well, I haven't been through this book, but I've I've done other things. It's too long of a list to... I've been trying to find ways to deal with this. Let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. This is... Oh, 
this part here is like, oh my god. So, the expected guilt. Guilt will rear its ugly head. Our culture teaches us that good girls don't hate their mothers. So you will feel the anger, rage, and sadness. You can expect to feel guilt too. Yay! Um, let it be okay to feel guilt for right now. In the in nearly every interview and clinical session I have done with daughters of narcissistic mothers, the daughter would mention how bad she feels as she is talking negatively about her mother. It is a taboo that you must work through to get to the other side. I'm not advocating that you hate her or express your anger to her. The rage will not last if you allow yourself to feel it right now. <sighs> okay. <laughs> uh, Oh, okay, so I'm going to stop for a minute because mm-hmm. I have felt it. <laughs> I have felt it and felt it and felt it. I've written and I'm written and I've written. Maybe there's just some just still there that I just haven't. I don't know. It's just Well, mm-hmm. and I wonder if it's different because you're a mother yourself. Maybe. Maybe because, you know, I can't. I can't just fly off the handle every five seconds, mm-hmm. you know. Right. And, but I, I do journal and I do write this stuff down. Sometimes I rip my journal and, you know, just mm-hmm. all these, I burn things. I've, you know, <sighs> it just seems like every, with every trial that I have in my life, I discover a new way that the my childhood has fucked with me yeah yep and i just maybe i'll never get over it and maybe the, it's just you're not alone like the those are the moments that get to me too oh. you forget you know mm-hmm. you repress and you forget there are moments in my life in my childhood that i literally don't remember mm-hmm because it was so traumatic and like my mom would talk about it and go remember when this said no you were sitting right there i don't remember it mm-hmm. so you know but apparently my dad set us all down and went diane i cheated on you and i don't remember it oh that's something you need to announce to the whole family yeah I needed to be there. And not only that, he had told every single, every single pastor that we had ever, and we've been to some churches. What? Yeah, he told every single pastor we ever knew. That Why? He had, he was he proud? It. He was confessing because oh. he felt guilty. Oh. And, uh, <sighs> and, um, yeah. So, and, and I don't remember. I don't remember that. Mm. I don't know why I would block that out. <laughs> well, I mean, our our minds do try to push trauma away. I mean, there are instances where people go through such severe trauma that they don't remember that it's just gone. And I just, like... But in, in a game I recently played, um, the person said, yeah, your, your mind tries to erase, you know, bad. Um, and she said the response is, but never enough. And yeah. the, like, yeah. I felt that. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's just, it always puzzled me because, you know, dad had guns. Like, you know, I've been whipped with every, anything he could find. But that's what I block out? Yeah, it is weird. Um, and (laughs) I've had, I've had just regular memories that aren't tied to trauma or like something. Well, I mean, like one of them was, um, an accident that my sister had gotten into. It wasn't severe, but it was icy and, or so I thought, um, and we, she had done like a 360 in the car and we ended up like on someone's driveway instead of in like the steep ditch that we could have been in. And, um, what had happened was I had had my Snapple open and it just went all over the place. And, like, we get done and I'm really young, so I just, I don't know what to say except for fart. (laughs) 
<laughs> and I was going over this memory with um, my sister who had been driving, and she goes, it wasn't winter. I was like, what? She goes, it wasn't winter. I overcorrected. Like, we didn't slip on anything. I just overcorrected, and that's what caused it. But it was, it was not winter. And I was oh, like, wow. like, in my head, so strongly, it was a winter situation. And, huh. yeah, <laughs> it's just weird. Memory's weird. Mm hmm Well, also, uh, what I suspect happened was, like, when you go through... Uh, trauma they've actually measured you know the um, parts of your brain you know things like that if your amygdala like, enlarges which tends to happen under trauma and stress um, but also your hippocampus which is effect, uh, responsible for mainly memory and things like that of course there are other parts of the brain that um, contribute to this as well but it actually shrinks mm. The uh, amygdala enlarges and the hippocampus shrinks. So you're really like your amygdala is fear and, you know, mm -hmm. those knee jerk kind of fight or flight um, responses. So, yeah, that's overactive, but your memory, not so much. And sometimes I guess the memories can also trigger that amygdala. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. it's really like, it's fascinating but anyways i just always thought that was weird that that's the part i blocked out and there have been some memories that have come back to me in situations that just i'll have a smell and i'll be like oh my god yes oh and the olfactory stuff the smells really get there fast to your memory like you remember smells uh subconsciously you know it's mm -hmm. weird it's fascinating but weird um so the next part i don't know oh i didn't even finish did i um you'll have to face your losses and disappointments before you can get past them you're aiming to get past blame to the point of deeper understanding and peace within yourself this will allow you to be at peace with your mother too and that might actually be the key to why I'm still angry is because I'm still like blaming her for her decisions. Mm -hmm. Like they fucking were her decisions. Yeah. Like, it, like there's no getting past that for me. Mm hmm. Just, oh. Like, if, if you're to the moms out there, if you're in an abusive relationship, and you're staying there because you feel like, but he loves me. Don't do it. Just get out of that for your kid. Because I'll tell you what, that kid is going through some stuff. And they're going to be hanging on it, hanging on to the grief and the stuff that they're watching their mother be put through. And they're going through themselves. Because if he's abusing you, he's abusing the kid, too. Mm. Leave. Please. Don't ruin your kid's life. Anyway. That. <laughs> yeah. Snarky out. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> but seriously, though, that... Yeah. If you're in a also I hear the excuse that well we're we're staying together for the kids. Yes, and that's Bullshit. like one of the worst things you can do for your children is remain what? in a relationship like that. Yeah, you're you're doing it for the kids so you can, you know, teach them that abuse is okay and put them through that trauma for what now? Mm-hmm. Just stop it. Leave. And I realize that there are people that can't, you know, leave, just get up and go. Make a plan. Do something. Please. You know, I, I realize with COVID and all that, there are a lot of women that are stuck. Yes. Absolutely stuck in relationships that are abusive right now. I get it, okay? But make a plan and stick with it. Especially if you have kids. I mean, do it for yourself, definitely. 
Um, but also, especially, it's more important if you have kids because you're teaching them that behavior. Mm -hmm. So make a plan, get out. As soon as you can. So, anyway. <laughs> Snarky's really out this time. <laughs> Quite all right. So the the next section, grieving the loss of the child you didn't get to be, the other hard part in this um, chapter. Uh, the next specific area of grief is grieving the little you who didn't get to exist because you had to be an early caretaker for your mother and sometimes for the whole family. Think about what you might have been able to do if you had been allowed to just be a kid. Imagine yourself doing those things right now. Write them down and again look at what you missed out on. Let your feelings be there. Feel them. If you're autistic, draw some pictures of you doing those things you wanted to do. Maybe as an adult you can do them now. We will be discussing this more in chapter 12. Um, when I first worked through this stage of grief in my recovery, I used an exercise that I often use with clients now. I would sit in a rocking chair after my children were in bed and rock, close my eyes and imagine myself as a small child. I would get this visual of a little girl with long blonde braids and red cowboy boots. I would then hold out my arms and ask her to come to me and tell me what she needed from me. At her first appearance, she was sad, stomping, red booted, angry kid with flailing braids, but as she talked to me, I became aware that I had to take care of her now and recognize what she had missed as a child. We would cry together in that rocking chair. I spent a lot of time doing this exercise repeatedly. Your inner kid will talk to you too if you invite her in. Write down in your journal what happens in each interaction. It's really cool, and I've done that kind of thing before. Mm -hmm. And it really, it was cathartic. It really was. Mm -hmm. it, you seem, like, at first it's, it's, it feels really silly. You know? It does, yeah, but... But it helps. Yeah. It helps you get to that that part of yourself that's, one, imaginative, right? Which is good. Uh, and it also, that imaginative state helps you really get to the subconscious needs that you have. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that need, you need to work through. So mm -hmm. that's good stuff. Yeah, it really is. And like, I just thought, well, I don't know that much is going to come to me, but it does. Like when you sit down and you work through this, there's so much underneath the surface that you didn't know was a big deal that ultimately is a big deal and needs to be addressed. Yeah, definitely. <sighs> I guess like a lot of my stuff is <laughs> when I, when I do these kind of things is bathroom oriented and I'll tell you why. I, when I was little, my parents, when they would watch movies, they would lock me in the bathroom. Mm. Right? Because Jesus. there might be there might be kissing in it or something and they didn't want me to see. But I'd be locked in there by myself for hours. Mm. And that was a thing that that was rough. Mm -hmm. But I kind of like found myself, I guess, in that bathroom. You know, I've, I've found the sorrow and the emotions and stuff, like, spent a lot of time grieving in the bathroom. So. I'm sorry you went through that. No, it's, I mean, it's not okay, but I'm dealing with it. Mm-hmm. We're working through it. And you've been a big help. Oh, you've been a help it. to me, too. And other people out there yeah definitely um so she talks about other techniques of course doll therapy mm -hmm. um 
go shopping and find a little girl doll that resembles you between uh, three and eight in age. Look until you find a doll you love. Bring her home and talk to her. Keep her on the bed, dress her couch so she is in plain sight to remind you that she has needs. Ask her what she has missed out on and what she needs from you now and write down the thoughts that come up so you don't lose them as you get busy with your day-to-day -day routines, which is, of course, easy to do. You want to be able to refer to the list to see where you need, still need to grieve and how to give yourself what you didn't get as a child. So this is a good reminder. This is something that I hadn't thought of before. And um, I'm kind of afraid to get a doll because if I get a doll, it might freak out my partner. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe, I mean, maybe make a drawing of yourself at that age. Yeah, yeah that, that could work. That would be a good good idea. Um, so yeah, as you engage in this grief process, allow the child or doll to speak to you at different ages. Allow her to go through her teen years, even up to 18. Branded into many daughters' memories are the moments when they needed a mother to be there for them during the difficult teen years. If your memories begin to go even into your 20s and into adulthood, go with them. If you give yourself the quiet and the time, the feelings that you need to process will surface. So, and she also goes into um, other therapies like um, EMDR, which is interesting because um, this was mentioned to me a few times. It's uh, eye movement desigitation and reprocessing. Uh, she says it's an area of expertise that's particularly helpful at processing feelings. I, it's it's different it's different i guess um but they say it works um so you look into that uh, they say it works a lot better than straight talk therapy basically mm -hmm. um so yeah um finding a good therapist is important so finding the right therapist means finding one with the proper qualifications with whom you can connect personally the key to a successful therapeutic experience, right? You have to be able to trust them, connect with them personally. Mm -hmm. For this particular kind of therapeutic work, I even recommend a female therapist who is older than you are. This is also helpful if the therapist is a mother or a grandmother. These are not absolutes, but helpful in establishing trust and emotional connectivity. Um, let's see. Uh, I did do an exercise for the uh, the child you didn't get to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did too. And uh, do you want to read yours first? Sure. Um, I I just entitled it "The Child Unseen," um, and I didn't come up with a whole lot this time. Like I think I did earlier, but I can't find those earlier like journal entries. But um, I could have been able to express any emotion I felt without fear of needing to stuff them away and hide any pain. I could have valued myself for who I am rather than what I can do for others. I could have probably spent more time with my father. I would have spent more time with friends actually being able to go to their house instead of mostly only being allowed to have them over at our place. I would have been able to come to her with anything without fear of her criticizing me or her making it all about herself or judging me. I could have talked to her about my depression and anxiety and get treatment earlier, um, maybe even in my teen years when it started coming up. I could have talked to her about PTSD that she attributed to without complete fear of the anger she would have responded with. Oof. Yeah. And yeah, I dare not mention this diagnosis when it came up because she was such a contributing factor to it. Yeah. That's understandable. Big time. Uh, I just wrote, child I didn't get to be. I used to play sports with the neighborhood kids and at school. I was, I excelled at math and probably wouldn't be afraid of it now since... I was taken out of school and my mom had to teach it to me and she traumatized me when she taught me math. Since mom's emotional need to be with dad who isolated us and took us away from my schooling and friendships, my ability to enjoy sports was also taken away. 
I grew up lonely, neglected, and craving my athletic endeavors. My dad would never play ball with me, even though I asked him repeatedly, and she couldn't because she was disabled. If I had been given the opportunity, I could have been a sports player, maybe gotten scholarships and guidance, support structures that needed, needed that I needed to be a success in life. Now, after years of my childhood stripped from me, I am too focused on merely getting out of bed each day. I have a void in my experience. The child I was never got to be. She was killed by her parents, leaving behind a shell of what once was a being. Jennifer, the bright-eyed athlete, is a mere echo. Hold the shell up to your ear, and you may hear her cries. Aww. That's fun. Right? Yeah. I like my metaphors. Yeah. Obviously. It was very beautiful. <laughs> but that's what it feels like. It just feels like just so distant, like just echoes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I still have that drive to want to be like competitive and to, you know, accomplish, but I can't, I can't mm -hmm. for one, I'm too old, you know, injure myself all the time, even when I just like walk now because there's so many injuries and you know, all this other stuff, been depressed away a lot because I'm depressed. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they killed her. Mm hmm. So. Yeah, that's definitely a, a child that, you know, will never be, both of us. Mm hmm. Yeah. All and of us, I should say, going through this. A well-centered adult that never got to grow up mm -hmm. to be that adult. So, you know, like, I knew what I wanted. <laughs> I want to play sports. Mm -hmm. I could run faster than all the boys in my class. But, no. Right. <laughs> it's just fucked up. Um, okay, so the most important aspect of the first steps of recovery for daughters and narcissistic mothers, however, is doing the acceptance and grief work on your own as much as you can before moving on to the next chapters and suggestions. If you don't work on acceptance and grief, the rest of your reco recovery won't take. You want, you want to have a true and lasting recovery. If you think you have grappled with acceptance and grief, start on the next few chapters. And if you find they are not working for you, simply come back to these first steps and work them again. You want to, you have to clean this house first before you move along to the emotional and spiritual home decorating. So you've been through this, right? Mm. You've been through the, this process and I still like, I'm in that doubt part, doubt, just put the doubt meme here, which I'm sure you'll find and put up there because you're awesome. <laughs> but I have doubts because I'm still like so fucking angry. Mm -hmm. and, and that's normal. Is it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The. Like, the whole time reading this, it's just like, well, I doubt that's going to happen, but I guess we'll try. You know, kind of one of those things. And, you know, like like my therapist said, some of these things won't go away. Um, no. We just, the best we can do is try to figure out how to cope with them. Um, if you can change it, then awesome. Like consider that an, an added blessing, but um, it's not necessary for you to be perfect in order to move on, in order to better yourself. Yeah. And I think, like, knowing that and not being afraid of the failures, which I still am, uh, the days where, like, Greg gets upset about something, and <laughs> we've been together for 12 years now, I think, 
Um, he has never hit me. He has never demeaned me in an argument. Um, we rarely fight. But there are days where he gets frustrated with something and I pick up on that. And immediately I go, what did I do? Yeah. And yeah. it's frustrating for him, too, because he feels like he can't feel those emotions without triggering me. Right. And it's like every time that I'm in there, I'm going, why do I do this? Like, the, there, he has never given, he's, he's nothing like my mother, but as soon as he gets upset, that, that's exactly where my mind goes to. Um, and all I can do is just try to work through that, I yeah. guess. <laughs> just talk mm -hmm. yeah it's it's like you know uh, we had an episode last night where you know i misunderstood things and got upset and like maddie and i rarely fight either but sometimes the stuff like it it affects your relationships mm -hmm. so you know we talked through it and we came to an understanding of what was really going on and everything's fine mm -hmm. Because Maddie is definitely not like my mother either and right. never abuses me or anything like that. So, yeah, that's really important is to have that understanding established. It's just, uh, so I, I guess what I'm asking is you're on the outside looking in um, on my perspective. Do you think from what I've demonstrated that I'm ready to move on. I think so. Um, yeah. I don't think, I don't think that rage is going to go away. I mean, at least for, for myself when I'm in those moments, it definitely has not. Um, but I think that if you are in a place where you um, understand how your mother is, that that you have taken the time to grieve for the mother you didn't have yeah. and have moved on to helping that, like the inner child um, get what she needs. Yeah. Um, I think if, if you have all those things going for you, there's no reason why you can't move on. Well, I have those going. Yeah, definitely. <sighs> I, I just so fucking pissed, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it, for yeah. me, it got better. You know, that's that's all I can offer. That's, that's what I'm hoping for, is that it'll get better as I go through the process. And if it doesn't take, uh, I'll go through it again, I guess. Mm -hmm. what, have I, what have I got to do? Is take mm -hmm. it. Oh, what? <laughs> and it's helpful each time. Like, like I said, yeah. this is my third time going through it, and I still learn things about myself and my childhood that is different each time so cool okay <laughs> i trust your judgment does that help <laughs> yes it does okay. immensely because like i said i had doubt mm -hmm. so i feel a lot better now but yeah so um well and this this example kind of goes into that uh, the second example she has is Mimi says I have never seen myself as a raging angry person I always thought that meant I was being bitchy and I avoided it like the plague and this step is very hard for me to do especially the feelings part I could talk up a storm about my mother but I never wanted to admit to myself that she had hurt me so much it was like she won again, and I was once again a victim. And I see now that I had to be this raging, bitchy victim to get to the other side. Yeah. So I think it's all part of it. <sighs> <laughs> I know. It's not easy. Aging, bitchy victim. Yes. That is, that is, yeah, just slap it right here. <laughs> For now. <laughs> yeah. Just put it right here and then no rag rats. We'll get the tattoos. No what? No rag rats. Rag rats? Oh, rag rats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm Mrs. Snarky and that's my art by it. I've shilled myself. <laughs> my duty. 
We're, we're lucky they're at work when we record these, usually. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, I told um, Greg, like, each time I come, I do these exercises. That's why I'm kind of glad we have the second computer set up in, in the spare bedroom. Because, yeah. like, if he's right there, I worry too much about the emotions going on so like when i yeah. when i came in here and i worked on that i was like if you hear me crying that's why like yeah you don't have yeah. to worry about it you know just leave me be yeah but... it's it's tough being like vulnerable and talking mm -hmm. about this stuff when you got you know your partner there because it's like you know that they're wanting to like comfort you and stop mm -hmm. the pain and all the no honey i've got to do this yeah <laughs> yeah and typically that's how it goes like is there anything i can do it's like no i just gotta i gotta do maybe some bread and get me a dr pepper <laughs> <laughs> yes that <laughs> but yeah so uh let's take a look so next chapter chapter 11 um, a part of and a part from separating from mother. So this is kind of where you go into how to dig yourself out um, because you're never truly allowed to be that that individual. You're always an extension of your mom. So, yep. uh, but yeah, so outro. Um, <laughs> thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. I hope it helped. Um, I hope that, you know, if you're in this type of situation that you do these exercises and work through it, it is so worth it. It is very hard, um, yeah. but it is so, so worth it. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stain them pages with your tears. Mm -hmm. Definitely. But not the computer. Yeah, <laughs> not the computer. That, yeah, that might sure. break something. Yeah, yeah. Put some plastic down, it'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, we could do like a Dexter thing, just cover everything in plastic. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. But don't be Dexter. Don't, no, don't, no. don't actually kill people, please. Yeah. Uh, we no. do not advocate for murdering of individuals. Yeah, or any kind of psychopathy. <laughs> yeah. Get help. Stop it. Get some yeah. help. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, man. But yeah, so um, hopefully I won't screw up the sign off this time. I have like more than a few times and yeah. I'm like, I made it up. I don't know how I screwed up. Like, I made it I up. I do that all the time. That's why like I, I usually have like a notepad or something that I have pulled up when I stream or something. Mm. That reminds me of my intro, my outro, and all that. Yeah, I should probably do that. Yeah, it's, it's helpful. Maddie <laughs> had that issue, and uh, I put it on a sticky note or something. Oh, yeah, I could do that. I have so many sticky notes around here, because I needed them for school, and now I'm not in school anymore, so they're just hanging about. But yeah, let's, let's try not to screw it up. Um, remember, life can be shit. Kind of is right now. Um, yeah. But let's get through it together. Keep hanging in there with Hashtag and Mrs. Starkey. Bye! Bye! Mwah. <laughs>
Yeah. With the bricks. Oh, yeah. It's crooked. The room is on a slant. <laughs> But at least your coffee ain't. No. No. I'm hoping it works. I'm hoping it freaking wakes me up. I took a bit of a nap. I'm still asleep, I think. Yeah? Yeah. Stop it! <laughs> just, just say it's your gremlin. It's my gremlin. Yeah. It's too much gremlin. she has a little gas today. <laughs> Your gremlin's trying to escape the door. <laughs> yes. AOL.com. No, that's not a thing. <laughs> if it is, it's from the 90s. It's a flashback. Right? Oh, man. We were talking about um, AIM the other night. No, yeah? Yeah, because um, I didn't have it growing up. But my cousin did, so I would, like, I got to make an, a username, and then I would log on to see if, like, my crush was online in summer, during summer when I was down there. It was <laughs> just so funny. Yeah, AIM was aimed straight into the ground. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it really was. Is ICQ still around? You remember ICQ when you had that... Mm -mm umpteenth digit long number that you had to identify as? <laughs> no. I see you. Uh, I see Internet you. Internet chat something? Uh. Because I, I think I've heard Greg mention it, but I don't. Yeah, it was, it was kind of like AIM or whatever. And they did have chats and stuff like that. But uh, it had a little flower logo. And anytime you get a message, you go, uh -oh. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> it was annoying. At first it was cute, then it was just annoying. Uh, uh, probably anyway. just like the you've got mail. <laughs> Worse. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's that whole section is probably in a blooper, but... <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> you've got mail. <laughs> also a movie. <laughs> Yes. Uh, was that the UPS truck? <gasps> Are we getting ding dongs? Oh no, he stopped like right outside the window, so I think it's the next apartment over. Oh no, ding dongs <laughs> for us. <laughs> Sorry. Damn it! This is a ding dong kind of day. You know what I mean? Right? Come on. Come on. Uh? Just I don't care if you're not delivering anything to us. Can you just go ring the doorbell? <laughs> Or just leave ding dongs. Yeah, that'll work too. Oh, I've wanted. We have put donuts on our grocery list for the last four times, and they never have them. Ain't no donuts. No, and it's sad. <laughs> I it really want sad. some donuts. Yeah, me too. Dang it! I did uh, get fish food though. Uh, the Ben and Jerry's flavor fish food. Oh, oh I was about so to good. say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I just yeah. I just eat those flakes like just mm, oh. yum. Oh. <laughs> mm. The flakes that actually smell like fish? Yes, they do. Oof. Anyway, sorry for the the UPS is interruptus. <laughs> <laughs> Upsus interruptus. <laughs> Uh, well, from this angle, I can really see your hair color, and it's nice. Uh -huh. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. I'm happy to have it back. Happy that the box dye wasn't old enough to, like, screw it up. Yeah. Huh. I think I'm ready again. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> but yeah. So the oh god, I've seen some really badly spelled tattoos and it's just. Oh, you should put that in your meme folder. Oh, I should. Yes. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, I ran into a whole article on them, actually. The, the same type of article that I pulled the Photoshop um, memes from. Oh, we got on our last nerve coming up. Mm -hmm. Yes, make sure y'all are subscribed to um, the Goddess Iowan. Yeah, that's their name this week. Right, <laughs> for now. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows how long that one's going to last. But. Hopefully, I mean, that's, that name fits. Yeah, it I think so. Fits. That, you, you got the side one, Maddie, that's, yeah, but yeah, um, this Friday, or no, the Friday before this one. Previously, <laughs> I hope you were there. Yeah, hope y'all enjoyed the show. I forgot about that, too. <laughs> like, oh, wait, this isn't coming out this week, it's... Right. Next We're Monday. advertising a show for last Friday. <laughs> anyway, last Friday of the month, 7 p.m. Central on Godless Iowans channel. We will be there, and you'll be there, or you'll be square. Mm -hmm. or, or you'll have been there, but you know, there's one coming up this next month. So, get on it. <laughs> yeah, get on that shit. I'll put the link in the description. So. Ooh. Editing me, make sure you add God the Silent to the description. <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting for the UPS guy to give us a ding dong. He's he's been here and gone. Ah, no ding dong. No, he didn't ring the doorbell. They also they came yesterday and didn't ring the doorbell and Greg didn't get the notification, so the cat food was just sitting there all day. Aww. They do this, like I just, it's so frustrating because it's like, we're always home. So, like, ring the damn doorbell so we know when shit got delivered. Like, what is, what is it with not doing this? I don't, I don't get it. But it seems like only sometimes they do. I just want ding dong. <laughs> you might have to talk to Maddie about that. If Maddie were here, Maddie would be standing right here. Right. Ding dong. Oh. 